wanted to say hello to everybody. My name is Fabio Parasecoli, and I'm an associate professor here at the New School and the new coordinator for the Food Studies program. Um, I'm pleased to welcome you this afternoon uh, for uh, this series of panels on New York's culture and current trends that we organize together with the Edible magazines and their editors. Uh, before I introduce this afternoon's program and our first moderator, uh, I want to tell you a little bit about the food studies program here at the New School. Uh, food as a subject of study and food studies itself as a discipline have experienced uh, a tremendous growth in the past few years, both in terms of academic programs and of interests among students and the general public. The New School has been at the forefront of this nationwide phenomenon. Beginning in 2008, we offered courses in food history, culture, writing, business, and policy. Our aim was, and still is, to join the growing conversation around food production, quality, availability, and sourcing that judging from your presence tonight, you've been following and participating in as well. We have recruited the mix of scholars and practitioners the new school is known for to teach our courses, and the response has been tremendous, both from the faculty and the students. After two years now, food studies at the new school includes courses on food history, food policy and politics, the environment, media, and a slate of issues that have come to the fore uh, as among the most relevant in our contemporary society. Uh, the food studies curriculum here at the new school is growing and will keep on growing in the next few years, not only in terms of courses offered to credit and non-credit students, but also of events and initiatives in New York City like this one. I won't list all the courses, but I would encourage you to sign up uh, to receive our catalogs and also to log on on our website in the um, flyer you've received, you have the URL. Um, I also wanted to point out a few appointments here at the new school that might be of your interest. The first one is the exhibition Living Concrete Carrot City, and you have a little flyer for that that will take place from October 1st to December 15th at the Anna Maria and Stephen Gatlin Gallery, uh, which is located right here at 66 Fifth Avenue at 13th Street. Um, Living Concrete Carrot City is an exhibition of creative and research projects that demonstrate the possibilities of urban agriculture. The exhibition argues that everyday practices of food production and distribution in cities, the actions of ordinary people in local neighborhood, register as quiet but persistent challenges to the agro-industrial complex. Living Concrete showcases design interventions and pedagogy that reconnect people and food production while transforming neighborhood livability, public health, and the environment. Now, the opening reception for this event is September 30th from 6.30 to 8.30 here at the New School, 65th Avenue at 13th Street. Within this larger program, uh, food Studies organized a series of brown bag talks uh, that will focus on different issues. Uh, they will take place on Thursdays between 12 and 1.30, and they're also open to the public. You'll have more information if you're interested in the, in the website. But just to whet your appetite a little bit, you know, since we're talking about food, I'll just mention the, the titles. Uh, the first one on October 7th, uh, where I'll be talking, is called Junk Fast Local Authentic. What is Food Studies about? Uh, on October 21st, Jan Gardiner, who's an associate professor of social ecologic history and design here, will talk about uh, a project on embodied agriculture she's working on. On October 28th, uh, two architects, Michael Morris and Natalie Pfizer, will talk to us about their experience in a um, uh, food and architecture studio that they had in the South Bronx. And it's very interesting. And then we have two uh, brown bags meetings on November 4th and December, 12, uh, December 2nd, I'm sorry, that will have actually be animated by our present and former students that are already working in food policy here in New York City. And the moderator will be Thomas Forster, who's uh, on our faculty. As I said, the brown bag talk are open to the public and you are more than welcome to participate. Bring your lunch and we will provide coffee and refreshments. One last thank you before we go on goes to uh, Chatwell Catering uh, that worked uh, with us to organize the reception. And now we can go to this afternoon's program. 
allow me to introduce Brian Halwell, one of the editors and coordinators of the Edible Magazines, who will moderate the first of today's panels. Brian Halwell, a leader in the local food movement, writes on the social and ecological impacts of how we eat. He's the editor of Edible East End and co-publisher of Edible Brooklyn and Edible Manhattan magazines. He is also a senior fellow at the World Watch Institute, where his work has focused on organic farming, biotechnology, hunger, and where he co-directs the Nourishing the Planet project. He is the author of Eat Here, Reclaiming Homegrown Pleasures in a Global Supermarket. He writes from Sag Harbor, New York, where he and his wife tend a home, garden, and orchard. Please welcome Brian Hallwell. Uh, thank you very much, Fabio, and thanks to everyone here uh, from the New School for <clears throat> providing this venue um, and part of the inspiration for this event. Um, to understand what, how, where we got the idea for the Edible Institute at the New School, you've got to understand the uh, story of edible communities. Uh, in 2002, uh, two women in Ojai, California, had this very simple uh, but radical idea to start a magazine that celebrated the bakers and the cheese makers and the fishers and the wine makers and the beer brewers and everyone in their food and drink community and they printed up a few thousand copies of the first issue and, they, and the magazine disappeared and Florence Fabricant at the New York Times got a copy and the editors at Savoir got a copy and it started getting press all around the country and before you knew it um, these two women in Ojai who started Edible Ojai magazine had requests from Portland, Oregon, and Portland, Maine, and South Florida, and the Lakes region of Minnesota, saying from people who had a similar desire to celebrate the people uh, who fed them. And today, we're very happy to report that there are nearly 70 edible magazines all around the country in big cities and little towns in red states and blue states, all propelled by people's uh, growing interest um, and, and growing value in um, having some connection to their food. And this grassroots publishing model that you see in the magazines out on that table, we have most of the edibles from New York State represented there. Um, it, the, the, our publishing model, uh, the flattering response that we've gotten, parallels, uh, parallels the shift that we see in our food system, where it's becoming much more decentralized, much more diverse, as opposed to getting our food from a few big suppliers, we're getting it from dozens, if not hundreds, of little suppliers all over the landscape. Um, edible is different, too, because as opposed to other food publications, we work from the assumption that food is the way that we touch the world around us. Uh, it's how we touch uh, the health of our families and uh, the, the integrity of our landscape and our local economy. Uh, and as a result, we have a higher standard for the sort of discussion that we have around food. Um, we are very celebratory, of course, uh, but we also hope to be inspirational. We hope to inspire someone to, uh, to, to plant a rooftop garden, uh, to, to uh, get involved in improving the school at their child's, uh, to, to improving the lunch at their child's school, um, uh, to try a new recipe, to visit a farm they've never been to, to, to try a New York wine if they've never drank a New York wine. And our events, uh, apart from the pages of the magazine, are events that we periodically do, a, a beer tasting um, at the Brooklyn Academy of Music, uh, for instance. Uh, th these events are where the magazine comes to life. The characters and the stories in our pages um, emerge and you get to meet these people face to face. And so last January uh, in Santa Fe, at the annual meeting of all the edible publishers, uh, we held the first Edible Institute, uh, where um, there was a panel about uh, the Southwest food culture that featured a farmer, a seed saver farmer, uh, who was introducing some traditional uh, bean crops that had been lost from a lot of the native cultures there as a way to improve health on the reservations that, that were suffering from all sorts of chronic diseases. On another panel, uh, there was a CEO of the largest food service company in the United States who had refused to pay an additional penny uh, per hundredweight for Florida tomatoes um, uh, to, to meet the demand of some striking farm workers. And he was on a panel right next to the woman who was the head of a competitor food service company who actually did agree to pay that extra penny and as a result um, was, was able to uh, help these farm workers in Florida renegotiate uh, their, their um, 
um, they're, they're fairly horrible working conditions. Um, so, so again, the, the, the idea wasn't just to educate, but to inspire change. Um, um, and uh, we have assembled what we think are four panels of uh, some very important uh, decision makers and innovators uh, and movers and shakers in the New York City food landscape today uh, for this Edible Institute. Uh, the new school was uh, the natural partner for this uh, because of its history of public engagement uh, and community involvement and because, as Fabio said, uh, there, there is this uh, very new and very well received food studies program that partly because of the, de the design school at Parsons and some other strengths that the new school has is able to explore food topics that, that um, other food studies programs in the city cannot. Um, and there's some other good timing, and that is that, that we are just at the beginning of Eat, Drink, Local Week, uh, which is, runs from September 26th, started yesterday, and runs through next Wednesday, October 6th. And this is our second annual Food Shed Festival. It runs for 11 days and includes uh, hundreds of partners around the state, uh, restaurants that are offering locavore priced fix menus and other seasonal specials, uh, New York wineries and breweries that are offering discounted tastings, uh, and uh, butchers and bakers and cheesemongers and other business partners who are celebrating the week in different days, in different ways. Uh, we have 11 ingredients of the day that we're celebrating, things like duck and clams and cauliflower, things that we'd like to see uh, 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 the, the week help build a market for, that they're underused products in New York that we uh, could be could be eating more of. Uh, and we also have an Eat, Drink, Local Challenge, uh, which we're, uh, which we're um, uh, urging people and challenging people to, to, try, uh, to try to hit as many of our list of Eat, Drink, Local to-dos, which includes everything from checking a cookbook uh, out of your local library, uh, to visiting a berry farm that you've never been to, uh, to, to making a pie and bringing it to our um, Eat, Drink, Local Challenge um, uh, finale party at Chelsea Market on October 4th. And there's more information about all this on the back of your programs. Uh, I also wanted to thank the food service provider here who worked with us to get as much local product uh, um, uh, into the menu for the reception that will follow as possible. Uh, they worked with J. King's, which is the, the largest uh, food distributor on Long Island. It's a locally owned uh, company. Uh, and uh, we are going to be looking forward to a bunch of different Hudson Valley cheeses, including from Coach Farms, uh, some, uh, some product from Salumeria Belasi. Um, some bread from Ore Washers Bakery, uh, and a number of other uh, delicious items. Um, so before I introduce Gabrielle Langholtz, who is the moderator of the first panel, and, and uh, I might as well welcome the, the panelists and Gabrielle to come up, uh, maybe just to, to get things moving. I wonder if you can indulge me um, one, one personal request. Uh, for the last few years, um, since I stumbled upon this poem called Blackberry Eating, um, I've been wanting to memorize it and uh, read it out loud at a party um, uh, sometime in the fall since it's a Harvest Festival poem. And I figured this was as good a time as any. I still haven't memorized it, so I have to read it, but I thought it would um, provide us maybe with some creative impetus for today. And this is by uh, Galway uh, Kennel, a great poet. <clears throat> Blackberry Eating. I love to go out in late September among the fat, overripe, icy black blackberries to eat blackberries for breakfast. The stalks very prickly, a penalty they earn for knowing the black art of blackberry making. And as I stand among them, lifting the stalks to my mouth, the ripest berries fall almost unbidden to my tongue as words sometimes do, certain peculiar words like strengths or squinched. Many lettered, one syllabled lumps which I squeeze, squinch open, and splurge well on the silent, startled, icy black language of blackberry eating in late September. So we're in late September, and um, I wanted to um, thank you all for coming. Um, we know people will be filtering in, some folks are delayed, and um, I want to introduce the moderator, my colleague and friend, uh, Gabrielle Langholtz, who's the editor of Edible Brooklyn and Edible Manhattan. Uh, she's the former public relations director uh, for the Green Markets in New York. This is why she knows pretty much everyone. And she splits her time between Park Slope and also Terrytown, New York, where uh, she has a young daughter. And uh, her husband, Craig, is the livestock manager at uh, Stone Barns, uh, Stone Barns Center for Food and Agriculture and manages the livestock for the Blue Hill restaurants. Thank you, Gabrielle. Sorry, 
Thank you, Brian. Um, and thanks, everyone, for coming out. It's such a pleasure um, to talk about my favorite things in the world. Um, thanks so much, Brian, for that introduction and that, that poem, which makes me want to go out and um, pick blackberries right now. Um, yeah, I'm, as Brian said, I'm the editor of Edible Brooklyn and Edible Manhattan, and um, I feel so fortunate to get paid to think about um, the very kinds of topics we'll be dissecting today. And um, it's so much fun to actually talk about it and not just type into my screen. Um, and what a pleasure to have assembled some of our favorite minds and mouths on, um, on these topics. So um, we have four panels today, and I could not hit reply fast enough, reply all fast enough when the question came up of who wants to moderate which panel, because this topic is um, one that's just so much fun for me, the, um, the DIY uh, renaissance phenomenon. So um, I'd like to ask each of our esteemed panelists to just quickly say a few words about uh, their, their place in the DIY world. And um, also, while they're at it, I'd like to hear a little bit about um, the, just a quick um, synopsis of the kinds of reactions you get when you tell people what you do, whether it's um, your parents' horror <laughs> or um, the bald-faced envy of, um, of friends at parties. So I'll start at the opposite end with the, um, the famous Mr. Mylan. Oh, actually, I wanted to ask, yeah, go ahead. Um, please do be sure to, yeah, to speak right into your microphones because they're recording, so we need to hold it right up to your mouth. Um, so Tom Mylan, of course, is um, the big superstar butcher. Uh, I think world famous might be fair to say. I've, I've read that. And um, you may have um, heard him on All Things Considered. He's spoken at Yale University, written for Gourmet.com, um, for the Atlantic food section, which I really love. And um, he also, in between all of that, uh, cuts up sustainably raised, um, lovingly raised animals for a living over at the Meat Hook um, in Brooklyn. So Tom, tell us a little bit about your, your perspective. You know your role in the universe and the kinds of reactions that you get when you tell people what you do. Uh, it is on? Oh, there it yeah. is. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> uh, it really depends on whether or not I'm talking to a vegetarian, I guess. Uh -huh. uh, uh, no, Wait, I, first like, tell me a little bit about, um, give me a little 101 <laughs> on you and what, on the meat hook and, and your work. As it relates I thought to you the, did a much better job than I could. Okay, I'll, I'll just repeat what I said. No, I'm yeah, uh, but tell me how it relates specifically to the, to the DIY phenomenon. Well, I mean, uh, I, th I think the way that the Brooklyn Kitchen Labs and the, uh, the Meat Hook... Uh, Brooklyn Kitchen Labs is where the Meat Hook is yeah, located. We're, yeah, we're inside of that sort of um, that weird complex. Um, but basically, more than anything, the, the, the Labs and the Meat Hook are a sort of clubhouse for like the DIY movement, at least in, in North Brooklyn, and uh, and that's kind of what we set out to do when we uh, conceptualize it. Uh, one mar cold March night, um, over a few too many uh, glasses of bourbon at the uh -huh. Roebling Tea Room, um, and uh, it is, it's an extension of all the things that um, both I and, and Harry and Taylor were doing um, them by like you know opening a, a kitchenware shop that that also did you know fun sort of like makery DIY events and then you know um, uh, and they specialized in selling things for like the serious home cook who wants to try. Can you give some examples of? Oh, I, I'm. What's a serious home cook? I don't know what that like is. Like the apple core peeler slicer for when well, you come that's, back that, from that, an orchard that's, and you that's have That's like, more of a fetish item, I think. I mean, well, it's not really like particularly like, I mean, but, but I mean like, you know, canning jars and like uh, pressure cookers and things that like people who really want to like get back into like, you know, cooking or, you know, like preserve, like making and preserving food um, like their like their grandparents did back yeah. when like DIY wasn't like cool. It was just what you had to do to like feed your family. Right, before the acronym. Yeah. Um, and just then, a way of life. Yeah, and you know, uh, uh, me and my uh, wife and Sasha Davies had been putting on a thing every year that sort of celebrated the DIY food scene in New York, uh, or in Brooklyn, called the Unfancy Food mm -hmm. Show, which is in kind of like opposition, um, or, or as an alternative to the sort of like um, largesse and uh, stuffiness of the regular fancy food show. And so that, that that's, that's what, that's why I'm here, I guess. 
anything about, quick about the reactions you get? Oh, um, I don't know. It's like some people are really like, oh, that's so cool. And then like, right. you know, other people think that you're the devil. And then there's like a lot of things. And, you, and then there's a lot of people who don't like, who like aren't really like in like the what's cool. The clubhouse. Scene. Yeah, they're not. And, and they're just like, oh, you're a butcher. Cool. You know what I mean? Like, like oh, that's a job that people have. Uh -huh. It's like a, you know, butcher, baker, candlestick maker. Janitor at a school. Like, yeah. yeah. I, was, I, was, I was thinking more like a teacher, but I mean, okay. Yeah, it's like a janitor. I'm like a janitor. Okay, great. Um, now, um, Ken and Kay is the Director of Agriculture at the Queens County Farm. And um, Crane's Magazine, I think, said it best that she has hoed and weeded her way across the country. So, um, you want to grab your mic and um, tell us a little bit more about um, your role in the DIY universe and yeah, go ahead. Okay. Hi. Um, yeah, my parents loved that that I hoed my way across the country. That definitely made them. <laughs> that never gets old. Yeah. Here you go. I got, yeah. I got res a lot of respect for that one. Um, but yeah, so I work at Kings <coughs> County Farm, which a lot of people even who grew up down the road don't know about. But it is within city limits, and it's 47 acres, and it's probably the longest continually farmed plot in the whole state. I think settled by the Dutch in the 1600s. So. Um, after about six years of farming in, on, in definitely more rural settings um, all over the, the country, really, it's a, it's a huge honor and it's pretty exciting to work in, uh, in New York City. I never really thought I'd end up here. So it's, um, yeah, I, I, we, we... You raise vegetables. Yeah. I know you've got pigs. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, we have a, a small diverse. livestock operation. Yeah. Tom actually does all our processing, all our butchering of, of our pigs. We raise about 12 pigs a year and um, three acres of organic vegetables, and we go to our green market on Fridays, and we have an on-site farm stand. We're really trying to vamp up sort of the, our place within our neighborhood, really, too, because we're right in, in sur feels like suburbia, really, right on the border of Long Island, but we have an on-site farm stand five days a week, and um, the, just the support has been amazing, and, and my voice is quivering a little bit. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Me too. Um, so, yeah, so, I mean, Don't if you... <laughs> Don't get off the farm much. Um, so, yeah, being out there, being out there definitely feels, a, you don't feel like you're in New York City at all, so I encourage you guys all to come out. But it is cool to have Union Square, to have people like Tom at the Meat Hook, and Kathy did an amazing dinner for us, Kathy Irway, last year on the farm. So we've been really just had tons of, sort of support and opportunities to build relationships, being that we're in New York City, to do cool events on the farm, um, dinners and pig roasts and um, all sorts of fun stuff, so. Great. Yeah. I literally, um, for my honeymoon, I went to Queens County Farm. Really? Because <laughs> it was during the growing season and we couldn't get away, so we went to the Outstanding in the Field awesome. dinner, which like costs as much as going to Spain for yeah. the week or something. <laughs> yeah. um, and it was, that one's expensive. It was fantastic. If you have not been to Queens County Farm, or if you have not been to Queens County Farm in the last like three and a half years, because the place has changed um, completely and um, it's a treasure. So check it out. Um, Ariane. Ariane Dagan is uh, the founder and owner of D'Artagnan. Um, and you may have feasted on their very fine duck and goose. Yeah, and other poultry. And, yeah. and other... Um, and game and meat. Delectable. Yeah. Yep. And um, she is... Her products are beloved by you know, the most elite chefs in the culinary world, Jean-Georges, and the list is far too long to, to list. But, um, and she has been DIYing it um, lot, much longer than anybody else on this panel. So tell us... Um, take it away. But first of all, this is the first time I feel so old, surrounded by... Uh, <laughs> people who could be my daughter. <laughs> um, but I've been at it for 25 years. So I started D'Artagnan 25 years ago. And I started it uh, because I didn't know any better. I started uh, and tried to reproduce what I knew from France. I was raised in a family of uh, restaurateurs in Auch, capital of Gascony. Gascony is a region of France where there is a lot of uh, polyculture. You say that polyculture. I mean, you you every farm has a lot of different harvests. Yeah. Like you might mean biodiversity or oh, something, bio, something similar. I, although I love okay. polyculture. Though <laughs> though they didn't know the word, but this is what they were doing. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a very hilly country, 
and uh, with very small parcels. So people had to survive in their own parcel. And because of that, they were making, and they are still making today, their own Armagnac, their own wine. Um, they raise a couple of uh, geese and ducks for the foie gras. Uh, they have a pig in the farm. They have a couple of cows farther. And then they do have some cereal, maybe sunflower, maybe corn, depending the uh, the area, if they don't have much um, vine. So uh, in Gascony, do it yourself. We've been doing that forever. I mean, this is not for us uh, and for me. Coming out of there, it wasn't so, something new. So I tried to reproduce that here, huh? and I got caught by the popularity that uh, we encountered with the chefs, the restaurants. Um, if you saw my business plan 25 years ago, uh, we wanted to develop retail stores. And then, because it was all of a sudden the chefs came and, and really liked what we were doing, which was basically sourcing uh, good um, uh, poultry at the beginning, poultry and meat today, uh, animal proteins, basically. Uh, we got overwhelmed by that. It worked uh, really nicely. So now, what, what we've been doing at the beginning and what we really emphasize now is the same thing and it looks like new, you know, when you read all the magazine, but 25 years ago, this is what I started doing and I continued uh, doing, which is, for example, uh, trying to, to create a cooperative. In The first one we created was in Missouri uh, with um, the help of Russ Kramer, who was one of the pig farmers over there and who was really hurting because Cargill uh, was sending them one after the other out of uh, business, basically because, uh, I don't know if you remember, maybe you're all too young, I don't know, <laughs> but there was a campaign, a marketing campaign that was really badly uh, uh, created that said, pork, the other white meat. Do you remember that? Pork, it's like the, other the worst white thing that has ever happened. The worst, pork. the worst. <laughs> So they tried to convince people that to eat pork instead of chicken because it was also lean. So they went into the genetics to create a lean pork. And this is dumb. I mean, if you want a white meat, you eat chicken. You know? <laughs> and, but the result of that was really dramatic for the small farmers. That's a different kind of DIY. It's like <laughs> DIY nature. <laughs> <laughs> DIY genetics. <laughs> So, so to make a long story short, so basically, with the help of Russ Kramer, who had some Berkshire pork and was interested in genetic, we decided to entice those guys who were dying around him to join our cooperative and to, um, uh, and to humanly raise the right way outside without any antibiotics, hormones, anything, pure Berkshire pork. And so, as we grow, the cooperative grows. In other words, instead of telling every farmer, instead of 80 pigs, you're going to grow 100 pigs now, we just stay at 80 pigs, but pay the right money and entice one more farmer to join the cooperative. And so with that success, that's what I've been doing now with ducks, with lamb, with whatever I can in my, in my specialty. Um, thank you. Kathy Irway is um, our last panelist. She is the author of a magnificent um, work of literature. It's not really literature, but um, it changed my life. It's a book called uh, The Art of Eating In, How I Learned to Stop Spending and Love the Stove. And um, it really did change my life, which is funny because this is kind of my belief system already. But something about the way you put it down on paper um, has really made me feel really guilty about going out to eat. Uh, but to put it more positively, it made me feel really, um, really excited about trying to cook in seven nights a week. Even though, you know, I also love going out to eat. But um, anyway, um, so tell us a little bit about um, the the cook it yourself phenomenon and um, the reactions that you get from the people you meet. I did that myself. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, that was hard. Um, so thank you, first of all. Um, I feel like um, when I started this food blog in 2006 uh, called Not Eating Out in New York, I wanted to tinker around with the idea of not eating out at all. 
and see how long that could last and also have a lot of fun cooking and making it more of a social activity too. And I didn't know where that would take me, but um, that was the goal. And um, in the process, I also found other benefits um, for the healthfulness of the food that you cook. Um, it was a lot easy, more advantageous to do that. Um, and also it was more beneficial f uh, for the environment. You had a lot less waste you're dealing with. You actually just got to know your food at a more intimate level because you're always cooking it. Um, and it, it was it's so funny because at the same time, I feel like the Brooklyn Kitchen opened. They had so many community events. I went to, you know, bread bake-offs and so forth. Um, and I, I just... And this, like, gr incredible groundswell. All yeah, sudden, right? yeah. And I tried to, you know, organize more events, community events, um, such as cook-offs, which was, like, a huge obsession of mine for a long time. And still is. I just went to a pie bake-off. Um, and supper clubs, um, creating a fun... Um, team of cooks um, and teaching each other and also sharing the dinner with with others just bringing people into the fold um, so it, it's been really a huge pleasure working with I think um, everyone on this panel um, Ari and I've had uh, D'Artagnan like partner with several of my supper club dinners so I, it was really fun Lily Hunt was in charge anyway um, <clears throat> so it's it's been a, a swell, this DIY phenomenon. I've been really happy to be there for the ride. And I think that the most common reaction I get is, um, well, I, I also write about cooking in and try to engage people in all sorts of publications like Huffington Post. And I you know, sometimes get comments from people who are like, what's the big deal, cooking? Wait, this is, we've been doing this since day one. Um, from people around the country, which is totally legit. And, but yeah. most of the time people are like, that is just the craziest thing, you know. How do you have a life? That's just no fun. Um, and actually, yesterday I was at a, I was signing books at a street fair, and somebody looked at the title of my book and said, uh, "I don't like the stove." Never mind. So, wow. <laughs> Non-converted. Um, terrific. Well, you kind of set me up perfectly um, for what I wanted to ask everybody to, to kind of do a group think on, which is why has there been this swell? Especially, um, I mean, Brian, in, in introducing us, talked about the um, the meteoric meteoric rise of um, the edible communities. I mean, there are now over 60 of these publications. The response is unbelievable, and it's just one you know part of this bigger picture of this um, incredible enthusiasm. And like you say, it it's something that, on the one hand, is well, it may be all of you touched on it, actually. It's completely, there's nothing novel about it at all. It's the, like the only way anybody ate throughout human history until, you know, our parents' generation. And for plenty of um, working class are all around the world, it's like not something that you would need to be told to do. But what do you guys think within this community that does embrace, you know, within what Tom called the clubhouse, what are the stars that have aligned? I mean, there's ecology, you mentioned human health. I mean, I kind of don't think that's, from my perspective, a big motivation for people. I mean, there's so much like, look, I'm making my own Snickers bar, <laughs> you know, yeah. or making my own bacon ice cream. Um, I, it, it seems to me like it's often pretty politically motivated. Like, I'm gonna opt out of this industrial system that I'm giving the finger to, but what do you guys think? What are the, what are the factors driving the phenomenon? I would like to disagree. I think that the health is a really big driving and like move on campaign and um, you know healthy uh, that Jamie Oliver food revolution trying to get people to cook more is a big part of the or trying to trying to get people to eat healthier is a big part of the food revolution and the at home cooking. And there was this great article in the Times that um, uh, Mike, uh, Michael Pollan wrote that was about, you know, America Nobody needs to anymore. come back to the yeah. kitchen and cook and, and then you'll really, and that's what I found out firsthand is that you'll really, and that's from a, a political perspective more than health, but you'll get to know like the choices that you have when it comes to food, choosing A or B, cage-free hens or, or eggs or not. And um, you're faced with those choices and you're more, it's more part of your everyday life. I completely agree with you that um, in terms of trying to change the American food system, that that's 
the motivation, but within and but within this kind of largely, I would say largely Brooklyn phenomenon, like the people who are um, coming to your bake-offs or who are taking Tom's classes, um, who, you know, 10 or five years ago might not have like desperately wanted to somehow get a slot to just apprentice with Tom for one day. Um, what is what is driving that kind of fervor? Tom, you would like, or, or yeah, take it over. You guys can fight over it. I, to me, it's taste. Uh -huh. I've seen the evolution, again, I started 25 years ago, I arrived here with an eye of a foreigner. I'm still Part a foreigner. You arrived, what did you say you arrived by? As With the uh -huh. eye of a foreigner. Uh -huh. okay. And uh, still today, a little bit, but still. When I arrived, uh, I saw, what did I see? I saw a, a, a vast majority of people who were going for convenience, and convenience being fast food, or being uh, conveniently uh, processed and pre-chewed food in the supermarket aisles. Uh, my, my biggest surprise here was, in the, it's, a, it's a weird thing, but it is, um, in the chicken uh, refrigerator in the supermarket, 90% of the uh, space is boneless, skinless chicken breast. Okay, and coming from France, I, where are the legs? And what are you guys doing with the legs? You know, I was, and where is the whole chicken? There was very little. I mean, there was one little, and today still, you go to Whole Foods or any store, you have that one little space vertical for whole chickens, and everything else is parts. So I think the uh, do-it-yourself comes after a self-consciousness by some people that maybe convenience has an inconvenient. It's not so good at the end of the day, you know, super processed food, and we saw it with a lot of fast food nation and uh, all that stuff. And then little by little, people are gearing towards, maybe I should cook. And then you have things like degustibus cooking schools, and it becomes very hip to have a very, very solid and, and expensive kitchen. I don't, know, I, I don't know how many dinners I've done, charity dinners that people have uh, spent a lot of money to uh, to pay for, you know, in charity and fundraisers, and I arrive in those kitchen that could be that could be for a restaurant right. with the Viking and the uh, wolf and then the whole the professional refrigerator walking even sometimes, and you go in, you open the oven, and there is still a plastic liner inside the <laughs> oven. So so the evolution was that, you know, little by little. Uh, learning how to cook by entertainment, and then little by little, hey, maybe it tastes better, and maybe it's better for me, and maybe it's better for the world also. And all that is coming today to th the other extreme, huh? which is I don't want to eat anything uh, farther than two miles away from my home, and I want to make absolutely everything. But but it's good. It's good to uh, to go the other side. Tom, where are you gonna? You're so chivalrous. No, I, I, th I think it's a really, um, like, it was really, like, I think something about, like, 2005, 2006, at least here in New York, um, really seemed like a, a, like a perfect storm of, like, a bunch of different things coming together. Um, I think, you know, what you were saying about making, like, the, you know, uh, like a political um, element to it, I think that, like, I personally ended up getting back into food because um, I had left it because uh, it was really, it's really kind of like it, it's a difficult job that doesn't generally pay well, you know, like most food or maybe, maybe not now, but like, you know, um, when I was working, you know, working through college and stuff. And, uh, but I came back to food and I came back to um, buying things at the farmer's market because I had become so frustrated with like, the, with, you know, I was living in San Francisco and, you know, I, we were, there was, you know, marching in the streets and all that stuff, like after 9-11, like, sort of the anti-war movement and, uh, and just the general frustration with not being able to have any sort of effect on, you know, th this, like, world that seemed like, you know, uh, this America that seemed like, like it had been hijacked. And I, it's like, so what do you do when you're frustrated? You make the, the political personal and you can, you can control, like, um, things and you can vote with your dollar. And you can say, I want to change things by what I consume. And I think that's another thing, you know, like, like uh, th there was, you know, the uh, <clears throat> ad busters and like all of those, that, that sort of like, you know, anti-corporate 
movements totally. and those sort of slam in together and then you get like, you know, it's this sort of like DIY maker culture, like running into this DIY, uh, you know, food culture that's running into like the food network that's running into, um, you know, uh, long, long standing tradition or, you know, uh, like, you know, things like what you do that started a long time ago and they were kind of like moving in opposition to like the, 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 the rest of it, you know, industrial food production, which was getting, you know, worse and faster and cheaper and like, you know, melamine and like, you know what I mean? Like not even stuff that's like food in there. Um, and, uh, and, and I think also like, you know, when you were, you were you on the opposite end of like, you know, the personal being the political, um, I think you have like people that are a little bit more, you know, red state, who were just like, what, you know, what, what happened to the food that I ate growing up? Like, you know, food used to be good. It used to taste like something. Like, wh what did my grandma used to make? And then, the, in, and the, there's a sort of, you know, rebirth in that as well. Yeah, um, it's interesting to hear several of you talk about taste, um, but I, I also agree or wanted to say, I feel like um, there's this hunger for, because you can get great taste without ever cooking. You can go, especially in New York, you can eat out. And I mean, maybe you guys are all much better cooks than I am, but there's something more than just having the deliciousness to experience it, to creating it yourself. There's this, um, Authenticity or kind of meaning that what do you say? Accomplishment. Accomplishment. Yeah, experience. I um, I saw this New Yorker cartoon that um, maybe you guys saw. This is I don't know how many years ago, like eight years ago or something. But um, it was God. I love this cartoon. Okay, it was the writer Marcel Proust eating. Um, <laughs> do you guys remember this? <laughs> eating a Madeleine. Or Madeleine from this box that says like, fat free, zero cholesterol, <laughs> now with no trans fats or whatever. And there was a thought bubble above his head and it was completely blank. Mm -hmm. So the idea was like, this is completely without meaning or ideas or there's no um, richness to it. Anyway, I just wanted to kind of posit that as one, one of the motivating factors, motivating factors that I sense driving the person to to sign up for Tom's class and make a meal that isn't going to be as good as you could go buy, but that that you get to kind of suck the marrow out of the literal and figurative <laughs> experience there. Can I add? Yeah. I, I think that in this community, there's a whole lot of creative people. I mean, it's New York City. This is like the mecca for artists, musicians, yeah. writers. And I think that food is finally a medium from, for which you can express your creativity. And I see it every single time I go to a chili takedown or um, what have you. It's People like do an art crazy installation. Things. It totally yeah. is. Absolutely. There's like all sorts of festivals about that, like the Last Supper that was last week. There's, yeah. Yeah, I was going to use the term um, conspicuous production, which... It just, and sometimes I do feel like there's a, because people know the con term conspicuous consumption, consumption where you're showing off like, look how much money I must have spent on this experience. But I sometimes do feel there's a kind of social pressure element that like, there's just so much, um, I don't want to say competition, but I guess that is what I mean. Or even, you know, literally last night I made um, probably the last pesto that I'll make this year. And I just felt like such a schmuck that I didn't make the linguine myself because I only had three eggs. And I, you know, it's not that hard, but it takes four eggs for the recipe I always make. And I was like eating it and just really feeling bad. Failure. Oh, what'd you say? Failure. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Exactly. <laughs> or I made my husband this um, tart this weekend for his birthday and it called for this, this apple cider tart that looked amazing. And I didn't get enough apple cider, called for a whole half gallon, and I didn't get enough apple cider at the farmer's market, so I went to the supermarket and had to supplement, and I just Failure. felt like... <laughs> <laughs> so it kind of is approaching, I don't know, religion, you know, more than just... Um, I don't want to say... It's so like how we measure how good we are as people or something. It's like, you know, like... 
oh, I, I bought something that I, that, that I could have made, like, you know, like... Shame! Uh, yeah, yeah shame. it's just shame. It's like, like but, but on the other hand, it's like, you can't make ketchup that tastes better than Heinz. You just can't. Like, there's a whole, like, article in, like, The New Yorker written yeah. about. You know what I mean? You have to, like, know when to hold them and know when to fold them with the uh -huh. whole, like, like, maniacal, like, the one-upsmanship and, the, like, the guilt and the shame of, like, not being completely DIY. You know what I mean? Like... But for some reason, I thought, oh, Kathy, you were about to say something. No, no. I find that I only apply that to food. It's like I've never made anything that I wore. I mean, like I knit a hat once. I don't really have that much compunction about, like, getting on the plane and flying to San Francisco, you know, despite the fossil fuel footprint and the, the corporation that I'm giving however many hundred bucks to. Um, it seems to just really, for, for this community, be very food focused. I mean, there are people who do other kind of, Oh no! I mean, the, the 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 sort of like larger maker community, like yeah. especially in in Brooklyn, is like it's is huge. I mean, but it's like especially like in in more industrial areas like like Williamsburg and and Bushwick. I mean, like every place that isn't like filled in with a restaurant is like a, you know a, a guy who makes custom motorcycles or like you know my my friend Alex has like a you know eight thousand square foot like custom fabrication shop. You know what I mean? Where you can make anything, and he's like he's like I'm gonna make you a still. I was like, okay, yeah, yeah, a really still. big one. I was like, all right. Can I have his address? Huh? Can I have his phone number? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Deals are made. You can well, borrow my smaller one if you want. Do you have a still? Yeah. Uh, did I even need to ask? Um, but I wanted to ask, okay, great. We're gonna op I'm going to ask one more question of the panel, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. But I just can't resist asking one more question. Um, it seems to me, I have to just, and I'm the biggest cheerleader booster of this whole movement, as you may have noticed. But I'm just going to play a role of, questioner for, um, for a moment. It seems to me that there is this kind of absurd self-congratulatory spirit of people being like, of, of this community, of, of which I'm a card-carrying club member, um, thinking that we invented it. Thinking that, um, and Aaron, you touched on this a little bit, like everyone in France has been doing this for, and you also, I mean, it's not just France, it's anywhere, anyone, anywhere. But, um, you know, I, one of the speakers that we had invited to this panel was Shannon Hayes, who just wrote um, Revolutionary Homemakers. And I was really disappointed she couldn't come because I loved many parts of her book. But I also was surprised that there was this element of, like, look, college-educated people are choosing to live on just $35,000 a year. Isn't this unbelievable? And grow their own tomatoes. There's, and I was kind of like, um, you know, like millions of people in America do that. It's not really um, something that is jaw dropping that you were able to find 200 people doing that. So, I mean, what do you guys think? Is, is there an element of that? Is it? I yeah. I, well, I, I think that. Um, you hit the buzzer before I did. So. I I think that you know. Shannon Hayes, like radical homemakers, that that title says it all. I mean, it's it's taking a bit of the past and it's putting it into a, a fresh new start of how to you know grow produce on the roof, keep chickens in the city. I mean, it's very different from growing it in you know in an urban environment. Growing food is pretty different than growing it out in the country, as you probably know, Ken. Um, and carving this niche out of something that is in an unlikely place, you know, an unlikely schedule for cooking all the time because we're working till like 8 p.m. And, and uh, you know, everything is very new, very fresh, and I see a lot of new phenomenon happening, like cooking clubs that just is not something that um, I, I've heard about, you know, too traditional. Or if it is traditional, then it takes on a new kind of shape and form and attitude. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. It certainly does have a new attitude, that's true. Um, Tom, or did anyone else want to respond? Were you going to hit the buzzer? <laughs> yeah, I lost my thought. <laughs> well, okay. Well, we could, we could, you could jump in any time. But um, I wanted to see if anyone in the um, audience wanted to ask a question of any of our esteemed panelists. Or just give your own opinion. Oh, I, th I see a question up here. Hi, thank you all. Um, I wanted to ask Ms. Kay, in, in being in Queens in particular, which is such a diverse neighborhood, um, even in a diverse city, 
what's the reaction you get from Queen re Queen's residents to the idea of a farm in Queens? And do you get questions? Do you do workshops and things for people who want to raise some livestock in their own backyards? Yeah, it's um, that's a thanks for that question. I mean, the the community is is incredibly eclectic and incredibly supportive. Um, I mean, believe it or not, just being in Queens, I mean, I don't feel like anything that I'm doing is new, in fact. I mean, most of what I'm doing, I've been reading out of books from the 19th century, you know, just, and being on an historic farm, it's all the more reminder that, you know, this has been going on for a while. Um, but it is, you know, even in, even in Queens, a lot of people have never been to New York City. They rarely go to, I mean, to the green market in New York City, and they rarely go into the city, the city at all. Um, so this idea of fresh local food is just kind of somewhat weird and and not I mean it's it's uh, the wave isn't really in my particular neighborhood the DIY sort of of wave um, so but the feedback has been incredible even the difference between this year and last year our farm stand is so busy it's just I mean last year we kind of had sleepers of days you know where people would just be like oh you know, having our little farm stand set up, but this year people, we have regulars that are lined up at noon when we open. So we're building a really regular customer base of people who are really excited about it. And even this year, you know, we, we think about, okay, what are we gonna harvest for Union Square versus what we're gonna harvest here with the assumption that people in our neighborhood in Queens will want more, um, you know, straightforward things, you know, not necessarily the, the I can't even give an example, because we grow a lot of heirloom things, ground cherries, husk cherries, for instance, people are really excited about it, New Amsterdam market and green market, but we're like, Ooh, what's the feedback gonna be here? And people love it. You know, there's just a lot of curiosity and support surrounding the movement. And I guess the last thing I'll say is we have volunteer days every Tuesday and Sunday, and it's open to the public, and I cannot tell you how fun they are. And I mean, the, the range of people that we get, um, we've got Joey, who's got, you know, his name tattooed on his knuckles, he's Joey, and wow. he's got like tattoos all over his body, he's 50, and uh, he rides motorcycles, and uh, he shows up alongside an 18-year-old high school student um, from a nearby high school, and um, gosh, we've got, you know, it's a Filipino, uh, South Indian population, um, Jamaican, we get all sorts of people who are really excited and, and teach us about what is, what they grow in their country, and um, well, I could keep going on, but yeah, that's that happens a lot where people go, oh, well, where I come from, we have a farm, and this is what we grow. Would you grow this? And that's pretty exciting too to be like, yeah, sure, we we can try that. So that's Tuesdays and Saturdays, you said. Yeah, and there are late? Tuesdays and Sundays. Excuse Tuesdays me. Tuesdays and Sundays. And how late in the year does it go? Do um, we'll probably do it um, until actually November. Terrific. So one, one more month. Yeah. Great. Any other questions from the audience in the back? Um, just to piggyback on the last comment that was made, I was wondering if um, any of the panelists, um, perhaps except Ariane, um, if anyone has had any um, contact with um, immigrant communities or any of the other local ethnic um, enclaves, especially um, in northern Brooklyn and Williamsburg that used to be heavily populated, Italian immigrants, Jewish immigrants, um, Irish immigrants, etc. cetera. Um, and I was wondering if that figured either prominently or perhaps less so in, in anyone's work or even any of the contact that they've had with, with um, as they move forward in, in their work? Um, we are based in Newark and I have a big project with uh, Cory Booker, the mayor of Newark, to uh, revive in the community um, some uh, community gardens and uh, farmers markets. And uh, so looking at it in Newark, uh, there is only one community that really pops up as uh, an ethnicity that has survived and thrived, and it's a Portuguese neighborhood. Um, all the other ones tend to, I mean, if you look at it historically, after World War II, when we started to grow food for convenience and not for taste, then we, we raised a whole generation, if not two, of people who cared less and less about taste. And so even though People are proud today to say my grandparents are Italian or my parents are Italian. They have very little remembrance, uh, you know, unless some some exceptions, uh, like your grandmother. But uh, here, huh, it's kind of uh, disappearing. So it's great to have uh, this um, DIY movement to to that makes you proud again of your roots in another way than just saying I'm Italian. In a way, saying and I'm going to make my pasta now, you know. <laughs> 
So th that's what I'm, I'm, uh, we're looking at now, yeah? I, actually, can I just respond to that? Yeah. Sure, I was gonna um, also um, weigh in on your question, um, but do you wanna go first? Um, no, that's fine. Um, I was gonna say, um, before um, my role at Edible, I worked at the Green Market, which runs farmer's markets throughout New York City, and um, we, many of our most vibrant markets that did the most commerce were in communities where recent immigrants lived. So, um, you know, Jackson Heights, Queens, um, Sunset Park, Brooklyn, like you could get stampeded, <laughs> Poe Park in the Bronx, and, um, p you know, people who grew up in um, not America <laughs> and um, maybe lived on a farm until they were 20 or at least like had the taste of raw milk in their mouth. And, um, you know, nobody knew the word locavore, nobody was like trying to calculate their food miles. It was just um, a, a respect and a hunger for real food, which um, gets, you know, if you <laughs> have been in America for a couple of generations, you might have lost. Mm -hmm. So, um, and, and I also was gonna say, the Green Market runs a program um, called the New Farmer Development Project, which ought to be called the Immigrant Farmer Development Project. I could put you in touch with them if you're interested, but they specifically work with um, recent immigrants, primarily from Latin America, to get established farming here and then selling at those markets to their own communities. Um, that, that's great. That's actually what I was what I was um, trying to, to maybe get out or elicit that sort of a response because, um, personally, my, my parents are Italian. They, they did come here in the 60s. We continue to do canning. We do make our own tomatoes. We do all of that stuff. We make our own sausages. It's not, it doesn't have that sort of level of preciousness. Not, I'm not suggesting that the panelists do have that, but it's, it's much more of a sort of a natural way of life as opposed to something that's cool and hip. It's something that's s sustained. Um, and, I, and I dare say that um, if, if anyone visits any of the other communities, whether they're, lo whether they're recent immigrants or established immigrants, these things sort of still continue on. You just might have to do a little bit more digging, but they are there. And certainly in my neighborhood, um, everyone cans tomatoes, especially this time of year, and everyone still makes wine. And um, you can sort of walk around and see like the, the crates and the tomatoes and the, and the grapes on the sidewalk that everyone's disposed on them. So they, they still do continue. It just needs to be, um, it, it just doesn't get the PR, I guess. What's the neighborhood? Oh, it's Bensonhurst, Brooklyn. Bensonhurst, all right, yeah. Um, especially in Edible Brooklyn, we love to, um, you know, we did a feature about um, backyard grapes and basement wine in Bensonhurst, people who like still, um, you know, make their own mozzarella and think that if it's an hour old, it's inedible. So, um, amen, we, we love to encourage people to get out and experience those, those vibrant food cultures. Um, I think I see a question right up here. Thank you for that terrific contribution. Up here? Yeah, thank you for that, and I, I, I want to, Yep. Okay. <laughs> um, I think that a lot of the questions are somewhat along the same lines in terms of, in, you know, looking at different ethnic, ethnic groups and maybe um, communities that are outside of the mainstream movement. Um, I grew up in the Lower East Side and I now live in uh, Bed-Stuy, not far from Bensonhurst in, um, in distance, but completely on the other side in terms of all of the things that we're talking about. My question is really that um, there are so many communities in my current neighborhood that actually are not more than one or two generations away from farming, um, but are so completely divorced um, in so many ways from fresh food and that, that whole idea of uh, what we've been talking about today in terms of taking the time to prepare them. And I'm just wondering, one of the things I'm struggling with is how to reintroduce this type of um, sensibility into communities where uh, we can, so, so much is based on convenience because of the need of, of those, uh, the economic need in these communities to work so, so much, the pressures that are happening in these communities, that people don't have time to make their own pasta and that is not the right way to go about talking about this movement with them because they're not going to see the value of it and they don't have the time. So where, where, how do we balance that? What are, I mean, are, is anyone kind of thinking about ways that we can engage um, from a class standpoint, different communities that don't have the time to, to, to involve themselves with this. Um, that was a big part of my, thank you for that um, fantastic question and comment. That was a big part of my role at Green Market was working in um, low income neighborhoods wh where the um, rates of food related disease are, food related illness are just catastrophic. And yeah, the, the kind of DIY trend among 
the hipsters that we're talking about in this panel, of course, is absolutely not the message for someone who's a, a single mom who's working and trying to feed a family too and on a budget. Um, the, um, the Department of Health um, has does some great work. Um, they have three specific district public health offices in um, the South Bronx, East Harlem, and the Bed-Stuy area. And I was really impressed with some of the work that they did in terms of um, understanding the community and the realities of many of the residents um, and try, you know, finding creative ways to, um, to get those sensibilities, like you say, draw people to the farmer's market, you know, printing up, I think, um, over $100,000 of worth of $2 coupons that they were able to give away to um, within the neighborhood to, that are only redeemable for produce at the farmer's markets. Um, there was, there's been, you know, for several years now, trying to crack the nut of getting EBT, which is the modern version of food stamps, accepted at farmer's markets. Because, you know, farmer's markets would go in and open in um, a neighborhood that has such poor um, availability of produce, but then here's someone who has this benefit, maybe it's $200 a month on this card, that they can't accept at the farmer's market because they don't have a phone, a phone they don't have electricity on a phone line, and there's no place to swipe the card, but they can go into the bodega and, and buy a Snickers bar, second Snickers mentioned in this um, panel. Um, so there's been a lot of work to get that infrastructure in place, you know, because even when the prices are competitive, People need to be able to, to shop with their benefit. But um, if anybody else on the panel wants to weigh in, but I'd also love to chat with you afterwards, after the panel. What? Oh, sorry. I think it's Tom's turn. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I live in a, in a, a, a pretty um, economically depressed neighborhood. I live, I live across the street from the Marcy Projects. Um, and I have to say that, um, and I, I've lived there for, for many years, and, uh, you know, it was, it's, it's kind of a, a weird desert, like that particular, like, you know, there's, there's like blocks of, like, you know, burn down rubble, like, and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> within the last couple of years, like, we've gotten um, uh, two uh, not sanctioned by a green market at all, uh, green markets that have just spontaneously, like, showed up. There's, like, like and, uh, th uh, and, and, and one that's actually, like, uh, like, half a block from a big, you know, from, like, a, 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 a grocery store, and they, it, it you know, the, the Amish just came and they were just like, oh, okay, like, oh, you guys want to buy our stuff, right? And they, they, they set it up and, you know, it, it's, it's, it's uh, like a more successful uh, farmer's market just in, in, in terms of like uh, how difficult it is to actually get to like, because it's so deep in people like just waiting to buy produce than like, you know, Union Square farmer's market. I mean, I think it's really like more than anything, it's availability. Availability is just you know like like really like if if you can if if people like can have access to like good food they would they will want to eat it you know and they'll find some way to buy it. A great way to find it is also um, by joining CSAs. There's been a huge growth of CSAs. Um, my friend just started one in uh, it's called Central Brooklyn CSA, and the location is in uh, Bed Stuy, and it's actually tiered so income levels, different household income levels pay a different certain price for a shares. Um, so that's always an advantage. Um, and I know I've helped her, you know, just put up flyers around the top neighborhood just to try to get the word out that it's available. Um, but, you know, they're, they're catching on. I live in Crown Heights and there's a CSA now in this neighborhood and there wasn't, it di didn't exist a year or so ago, but now it's very popular, so. But I also want to acknowledge the big picture that, um, that the farm bill subsidies make cheap food that makes you sick really available and, and I mean, Tom, I hear you saying like, if you make the food available, people will buy it, but um, it's just common, I, I kind of disagree. I think that it's just common sense that um, if you can get ready to eat food for less money and, and it's full of sugar, fat, and salt because those things are subsidized. Then something you have to go home and cook yourself and try to get your kids to eat vegetables. I mean, my own kid will not eat vegetables. Like, I don't know if she's had any vegetables in like five months. <laughs> watch me cry. So, um, she's a toddler. Um, 
So I think until we address those billions of dollars, big picture support of this other food system, these kinds of efforts to get to make you know a, a farmers market in a in a neighborhood where there's low produce, they'll they'll be hitting a small hammer at a really big problem. And and it's not only about the uh, the money behind the processed food; it's also about uh, education of the kids. That's where it starts, you know, nutrition and education of the kids. And it has to be uh, playful and it has to go very, very slow because you, can't, you cannot tell somebody to go buy an organic egg when it's three times the, uh, the price of a regular egg. Yep. Economically, it doesn't make sense. But once a kid starts to make uh, its own mayonnaise and, it, and, and it's much better than the, the canned processed stuff, and on top of that, it's made with a good egg. And once you go there, you don't come back, supposedly, once every two times, and little by little. But this is how I'm going to be approaching it in New York, you know, by, first of all, education of the kids, and little by little, starting with the nutrition. Our next panel will be on do-it-yourself community and um, do-it-yourself lobbying. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, thank you so much to our audience and panelists. We're going to have a um, quick break and um, get back for some more discussion. Thank you.